Good evening, everyone. Can you guys hear me in the back? I'll take that as a yes. No? <laughs> I think this is probably the best I can do here. So um, what, what is the talk about revolutionizing travel through data? Um, in this session, I think what I'm trying to cover is how we actually use data within the travel industry, um, what kind of decisions we make based on that, and uh, in, in turn, it actually tells us what to build and what not to build, right? And um, the way I'm trying to tell the story here is, so we at Orbit started using big data in 2009. So we went through multiple iterations of technology platform, and with each platform came a lot of use cases that we actually solved. And in the process, we tried to leverage a lot of the analytics concept here. So by the way, I'm Raghu Kashyap. Um, my two kids were pretty excited to see that they could actually find a child beer in India. So um, I, I've been with Orbitz a little over 10 years now. Um, I'm from a tech background. So I help support the technology platform for Orbitz worldwide and um, also the application development side of the world. So last two years, we've been in Orbitz uh, India. So we've been uh, uh, working on both the data platforms and the application development. So by the raise of hands, who's heard about Orbitz? All right, quite a few of them. Good. So we are not the gum company, absolutely not. Um, we are not the drink company, although we bought the naming rights from them. So that's an interesting story there. And lastly, this is very specific to Bangalore. There is actually another company called Orbitz in Cunningham Road. So it was quite interesting recently, somebody actually ended up in Cunningham Road instead of MG Road. So that's not us. So what we do, we are an online travel agency, right? We sell air, car, hotel, packages, insurance, travel extras, attraction services, you name it, right? And we have multiple brands throughout the world. We are actually one of the top three travel agencies in the world. So you have Expedia, Priceline, and Orbitz. And Orbitz is predominantly in North America, but we, are, we have a presence in Europe and Asia Pacific. Um, we actually have a lot of other um, business units that we work with, not just the travel leisure sites, right? So what have we been doing in the industry? What have we been contributing back to the community? I think at Orbitz, we, we use a lot of open source, and uh, we actually give it back to the community. So obviously, some of the authors of these books work at Orbitz. And uh, we also presented at a lot of the conferences um, in US and uh, Europe, <coughs> Europe. So the interesting thing is there are two things that we actually open sourced, which is more of a data platform. One is called Graphite. The other one is called Irma. Irma stands for Extremely Reusable Monitoring API. So it's mostly you use for your monitoring applications and the visualization um, that comes through the Graphite tool. So why is travel important? I mean, as you guys, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys travel, right? So as you travel, you see a lot of options available out there, whether to book, search, uh, places to stay, places to go. So if you really look at the industry, right, this is the fastest growing sector in the industry. And the numbers clearly shows that. Like the travel alone is around $2.3 trillion, right, US dollars. And the impact travel has on the overall economy is close to this $7.5 trillion. Now, how does this relate to my talk here, right? As the scale is big, so is the data that comes with it, right? And we have tons and tons of data that comes as part of this, uh, internal data, external data, we actually buy data. So it, it's a combination of a lot of things. So what were some of the challenges we actually faced, right? I mean, most of you guys have faced similar problems, I'm sure, and today we've had some really great presentations. A lot of them are trying to solve similar problems, similar technology, but for us, we actually faced the same problems six, seven years ago, right? So the data sets that we used was not as big as to how we would leverage it. Um, the multi-dimensional aspect of the data, that was another challenge for us. So um, you must have heard some of the site analytics data, right? Our tools, Google Analytics, Site, up, um, site Catalyst, 
uh, web trends. So most of the companies use this, right? But there are a lot of limitations with that, and that's just the site analytics data. Um, so if I ask you somebody, or if you ask you guys saying, what might be the conversion ratio or conversion rate for travel bookings in general, what would you guys guess as? What percentage is it? Any takers? One, five. Actually, you guys are pretty close. It's actually 3%. So think about the 97% of the customers who don't book. That is where the optimization is, right? The 3% know you guys. They want to travel. They want to buy. So they actually bought with you. But where you can really leverage data and uh, where you can actually really optimize it is the 97% of the people. You don't know why they left. You don't know why they didn't buy. You don't know what their mindset is. So that is what you want to really tap into. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last seven years. right? And the other problem we had was sort of a controlled environment. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard about BI, data warehouse. A lot of organizations use this. And certain places, it's harder because you have a very strict controlled environment. And um, it's harder to get to data, and you need a set of people that you want to use to do certain things. So that was another challenge we actually had. And last thing, last but not the least, it's speed, right? For us, or for any online company, the speed at which you need to make a decision is pretty quick, right? That's what you want to look at. So if you launch something today, you want to know in the next hour whether it's working or not. You don't want to wait for three months or six months. And those were some of the challenges we actually faced. So we actually went through our first iteration of Hadoop platform. This was in 2009, right? So I'm sure this is a common theme that most of the people have used um, initially, where you take a lot of the raw data, put it in your HDFS, um, you do your parsing, whether it's MapReduce or Pig or whatever it is, you dump it into your Hive data warehouse, and then you actually take it and put it into your actual warehouse, right? That's pretty much what we did. There is nothing different here. So when we did this, there were a lot of things that we were able to leverage, right? Even though it was the initial iteration for us, we actually called it Owlitex 1.0. Um, so there were a lot of things that we were able to tap into this architecture. So the next few set of slides, what I want to walk through is, what are the use cases that we were able to solve using this platform? And what were the insights we got? And how did we leverage analytics on top of that? So lifetime value, right? I mean, this is one of the critical indicator that any online travel, or even offline for that matter, would love to understand better, right? And if you know better, customer is the king, right? I mean, you want to please your customer at all the time. Uh, gone are those days where you don't treat your customers well. You don't treat your customers well, they're going to go somewhere else, right? So you really need to understand your customer well. So what we really did was we focused on acquisition retention. So acquisition means where are we getting these customers from? Uh, in online marketing, there are multiple channels where we actually get them from, right? And um, retention is that, OK, so how are we retaining our customers? Are they coming back to us? Are they not coming back to us? Why are they not coming back to us? So all these questions we would need to answer. So what we really did was we took a lot of attributes related to the customer, for example, the channel where they came from, how long they were on our sites, um, how soon did they return, when was their first purchase made, what channel was the first purchase made. So you take all these attributes or x variables and build your regression model out there. right? And when you do that, you associate a value to a customer. And that's the customer lifetime value. And the way we associate the value is in dollars. right? You can take it as $5, $10, $15, whatever it is. So now what we were able to do with this is we have call centers where customers call. right? So you look at the tiers of these customers and route them according to that through your IVR system. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is you, you tend to promote a lot of things with these customers, whether it's coupons, uh, promotions. So because you know these are the guys who are very loyal to you. And the third aspect is loyalty. right? For us, as Orbits, uh, we are very focused on loyalty. So one of the things we do is called Orbux. Right? You book hotel, car, air. 
you certain percentage of that is given back to you as points or arbucks and which you can use for your future travels so these are some of the aspects of it we were able to derive based on the lifetime value of the customers so i i thought briefly about channel right um, have you guys heard what the marketing channel is Yes, yes, okay. Let me, let me just give a 10 second intro to marketing channel, right? So you have SEO, you have your PPC, which is pay per click. So you go to Google, you search at the top and at the right, you get results in a different color, right? Those are paid advertising that we call PPC. Then in um, direct is somebody who comes to your site directly. You have display channels where you look at, let's say you go to CNN.com or you go to Mintra.com, you see ads for us, those are the display channels. So there are like eight or different 10 channels where we will have to optimize it, right? So allocation of bookings to a channel is a huge deal for us because any online industry, almost 50% or more than 50% of your spend is on marketing, okay? And if you don't allocate it properly, you won't know what's your revenue per click. You don't know what's your revenue per customer, right? So that's why attribution matters a lot for us. So there were a lot of models we play around with, last click, first click, equal attribution, time decay. So you take every customer and you look at what channels are they coming from, you try to play around different kinds of algorithm in terms of which channel should get the credit for, right? Because in the end, based on that, we decide whether we wanna spend more here or less here. That matters a lot in our marketing. So this is an interesting use case for us. Mind you, this was done in 2010, I think. Um, most of you people are aware that people with Mac spend more money than with people with Windows. It is an evident truth, right? What we did was we took it to the next level. We tried to figure out how does it impact travel, right? So we, we really tried to analyze how the behavior is between users using a Mac versus a Windows, right? And what we actually came out was pretty interesting. People with Mac tend to book a higher rating hotels, and they prefer a lot of hotel amenities that are very luxurious, okay? So you look at hotel amenity, for example, they wanna have a poolside view, they wanna have free Wi-Fi, they wanna have lots of aspect, proximity, right? Those are the things they look at. So what we did was we actually tried to play around with the sort results, right? When you do a hotel search, you want to show them what they want to see rather than showing a generic result that everybody gets to see, right? So this way you're personalizing a little bit more. And the second thing we did was, um, sorry, the second thing was more around the recommendation engine, right? So you take the same attributes, you understand your customer, and you actually recommend them based on their likings. So these are some of the things that were um, pretty amazing when we initially saw that, uh, but it is, it is consistent in how the behavior is, actually. And, and in fact, this one was interesting because this really let uh, the personalization aspect of our site. We do a lot of personalization based on the machine learning. Uh, so what we do is we take the data, we build the algorithm, we eventually funnel that back into our applications through um, real-time systems. EFX, so every freaking X. Um, <laughs> if you know statistics, X variables matter a lot, right? So you wanna consider as many X variables as possible to really derive your models. So for us, hotel sorting is everything, right? I mean, there is a saying where um, the thing goes like this, right? I mean, where do you hide a dead body? On the second page of the Google results. Right? So nobody goes to the second page. That's exactly the same concept for us in hotel, right? Everybody wants to see the results in the first page, not just the results, relevant results to them, right? So for that, we actually spent a lot of time trying to understand how do we want to place our hotels? Where do you want to place it? How do you want to sort it? So we do premium placement, we do um, enhanced value sort, a lot of different ways we actually do it. So what we did was we took all these factors in, we started building regression model around this, right? So we figured that for us between 
3 and 5 was where most of the sort results were booked or even clicked for that matter. So based on this, what our revenue management teams do is they actually play around the, the settings of the sort in real time. So there is an application which actually does these analysis and pumps the data back enough in, to the revenue management team, which actually in real time, they change and play around the triggers for this. So predicting hotel stay, that's another interesting topic for us, right? So by the way, this one is actually Chicago Lakeshore Drive. This was the winter of 2012, right? Everything came to a complete standstill. The reason I have this one and actually the Super Bowl is it matters on the stay because when you look at how people book or how, how they prefer to book or how there's, there's a concept of advanced purchase window and an advanced search window, right? How far in ahead people search for it. Um, and usually it's anywhere between 15 to 60 days, right? So you want to figure out, okay, so you want to figure out what day of the week it matters a lot and what time it matters a lot, what kind of sorting rate, ratings that matters a lot. So the interesting thing about this is, on this day when there was a snowstorm, the same day bookings skyrocketed, right? Everybody didn't know where to go, they left their cars in the road like this, they actually took their mobile, booked a hotel close by, walked to the hotel. This is why it's very important for us to figure out the weather data into the picture. So we pull in a lot of weather data to analyze the seasonality and figure out how people stay or what is the potential pattern of people staying there. And obviously the location matters, right? So those were some of the business use cases, right, in the first iteration. We also built like one or two tools that really helps us um, are more, rather helps the developers more in terms of their operations and development. So one such tool we actually built was called business monitoring tool. So I don't know if anybody recognizes this application, but that's actually ClickView, which is an in-memory visualization tool. So what we did was we hooked up ClickView directly to our Hive system. And what we did was before the Hive system, there were MapReduce jobs, which would actually run um, algorithms to really figure out the blended rates of our error. So what they would do is they like every site has errors, right? I mean, you do a search, it fails. You, you try to book, it fails. We categorize them into different error buckets. The reason we do that is these error buckets has, or the blended rates, has monetary value associated with it. So you want to go fix the first one that impacts your revenue the most, right? For example, if the color is different, and there is a, another bug where the bookings are failing, obviously you would prioritize the booking failure first, right? So we did this as an overall blended rate margin, which kind of buckets like 1,000 plus errors that we get from different operations. Mind you, our system depends a lot on third-party systems, right? GDSs, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you guys have heard about Amadeus, Apollo, Galileo, these are all GDSs, right? Our systems depend a lot on these systems. And these systems are built on mainframe. So you can imagine their systems and the complexities that involves to work with these systems. Um, what else? All right, there is another tool that we actually built out. This is actually where we leverage Flume. So one of the things that we used, uh, I would probably say around 2006 or seven was Splunk. And now Splunk is pretty good. It wasn't as good at that point of time. So we used Splunk for two years and we figured out there were a lot of issues with that. And it really didn't scale up to what we had with the data and everything. So we actually, what we did was we, we funneled all our application logs. So we, use, uh, we used to use JBoss Container at that time. Uh, now we use actually Tomcat. Um, so we used to funnel all the container logs or the application server logs into Hadoop directly through Flume. And we actually did it in two pipes. One went into Hive, or sorry, HDFS, and the other one actually went into HBase. So with HBase, as you are aware, you're gonna structure it a little bit better uh, compared to HDFS. So we built, I mean, this is the most ugliest UI you would probably ever see. 
um, but it did the job, right? And as a developer, you want to find out something wrong in production, you would go look at it, it will run a MapReduce job, get you what you need, boom, you're done. The other thing we actually, which I don't have here, is we also built something called another tool, but that was much faster because we indexed it. And we indexed it only for the first six hours. Because if you are troubleshooting a production issue, you don't want to wait for the MapReduce job to complete. You want it much faster than that, right? So that tool would give you data only for the six hours, but that will get the job done when there is a crisis going on. So what did we learn from our first iteration, right? There were a lot of things we learned from our first iteration. One is we kind of decentralized this model where every development team had access to this, they would go do their own analysis, they would go do, do their own visualization. Um, we called it the decentralized model, right? But then the challenges that came along with that was um, basically it's harder to scale. I mean, you, you can't really scale with that approach. I mean, somebody will use uh, maybe Kafka, or somebody will use uh, something else. It's really harder to scale. So the second problem we saw was data governance, right? Um, data governance is absolutely critical when you deal with data. Because what it means to you, it means something else for somebody, then you lost the whole purpose of how you deal with data here. That's a huge problem when you're looking at, let's simple, simple example is conversion, right? So we have around um, four, five different brands and probably around 30 different websites. Each of these guys, when they say conversion ratio, would mean something else for them. And as a leader, it, it would get really hard for them to oversee the overall business. That is why data governance is very important. And that's one of the challenges we saw. And the scalability, our first version, um, was interesting because we, we had an FTP server sitting on our desks, which would actually hold terabytes worth of data, and there was no backup. There was no redundancy failure. There was nothing, right? And if this guy forgets and plugs the thing out, then done. We don't have access to data. So there were a lot of problems with that. So what we really did was, OK, so we, we did one version, and we said that, OK, let's go to version number two, and we're going to do a little bit more put some thought into that, I would say. Um, we said, OK, so what is your foundation, right? Your foundation is mostly your data infrastructure. And what do you do after that? So you want to do descriptive analytics. Descriptive analytics is nothing but building reports. You want to see what happened yesterday. You want to see what happened this month, this week, last month, everything. Then you talk about predictive analytics, right? OK, now you know what happened all this while. Let me try to figure out what will happen next. That is all about predictive analytics. Then comes your machine learning, right? With machine, the key difference with predictive and machine learning is with predictive analytics, it's all the analysts sitting in our organization running models and regression analysis. But with machine learning, what we do is we do the same thing, but we actually let the machine learn through the process. We keep feeding more data to it. And that's kind of how we saw the vision of what we want to take this data into the next step, right? Um, this is actually an interesting tree map of our cluster. Um, so we have a script that actually generates this tree map for us. Um, but it, it's interesting because every time we run into an 80% threshold, that's when we start thinking, saying that, hey, we need to add more nodes. And we add it, and we kind of publish the next tree node out there. So the current cluster is uh, roughly around 4 petabytes, I would say. Um, but um, that's kind of where we are. So right now we're in the process of moving from a 4 terabyte disk space to a 6 terabyte disk space and uh, bumping up uh, from 128 to 256 gigabytes. So that's kind of what we're thinking through. Um, so the next set of few slides talks about the use cases that we solved with iteration 2 or version 2, right? So this is actually a public-facing website. You guys can go check it out. What we try to do is we try to help travelers. We try to give them as much information as possible. All right. To do this, we actually do a lot of analysis and publish it out so that people can make informed decision in terms of where they want to travel, what they want to do. It's sort of like a research, but helping with the data. Right? Right? So we built this tool, which kind of does a lot of things. One of the things is city recommendations, which basically says, hey, I, 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 wanna, I, I live in Bangalore. I want to go see what's the close by where I want to visit. Or maybe I'm in San Francisco. I want to go see something close by. 
So that's kind of um, kind of a algorithm that's built out to really leverage a lot of the data that we have to give this in the hand of customers. So SEO. Um, SEO is search engine optimization, right? So you go search a keyword on Google, um, the chances are you're always clicking on the first link. Why is that? Because it's SEO optimized well. You are getting the relevant content of what you need. For us, it's a huge deal because, like I said earlier, 60% of our spend is on marketing. So we always want to pay attention to the paid channels first, where you pay money. SEO is free, right? I mean, people argue it's not free, but for all practical debate, it's free. So we want to understand how do we basically um, talk about SEO, which is more about kind of giving the credit to SEO where it's due so that we can actually invest more in SEO, right? So one of the things we did was um, this called multi-touch, right? So you, you look at your channels, you look through the journey of one to 30 days. By the way, that's an ind industry standard where people look at 30 days for channels. Um, so you look at that and you try to figure out, okay, how much traffic am I attributing to SEO? That's one step. But the second step really is to figure out what is the influence of SEO on the other channels. Now we are able to actually show a lot more value to SEO, which kind of um, justifies why we spend more on SEO. So, um, like I, I talked about GDSs where we have a lot of dependency on third party systems. Uh, one of the things that we are contractually obligated, both monetarily and contract wise, is look to book ratio, right? How many times you look or search and how many times you book. We have to be very careful on look to book ratio, otherwise we end up pay spending a lot of money or paying them as penalty. So we cache a lot of our results, our data within our house. So now once you start caching it, you need to understand, okay, how do you optimize your cache, right? You don't want to just say, okay, after eight hours, just re recycle the cache. So what we did was we did a survival analysis of the cache for hotels. We broke it down into two markets, or rather two groups, A and B. And each market we put, or each group we put eight markets. When I say markets, it's city for hotel, whatever. And then we started kind of fine tuning um, the test group, right? So you have a test group and a control group. So when you start finding the test group or the control group, then you really see how you can optimize or you find that sweet spot for your TTL, which is time to leave. Right? With survival analysis, it's, it's more about when does the event occur, and that's when you figure out you want to change the cache or not. And based on this, we were actually uh, able to maintain our look-to-book ratio on a pretty steady level without impacting our cache hit ratio and the search results that come out here. Um, Keywords, right? This is another area where we spend a lot of money. Every organization, online organization, spend money on bidding. Basically, we all pump money to Google. That's how it is, right? Um, and, and, and with SEO and SEM, pretty much you sell your soul to Google. That's how it is. Uh, so keywords, right? You want to bid for keywords where it makes sense, where people click on that keyword and come to your site. Otherwise, it's a waste of money, right? So you really try to target this one. This is called the long tail, right? This is where your high probability of conversion is, and that's because not everybody is bidding here, right? But if you go here, the conversion ratio is less, and the competition is too high. Everybody, simple example is cheap hotels, right? That's pretty much here. That's pretty much there because everybody wants to bid for cheap hotels. And when I say everybody, the all online travel companies I'm talking about. But when you go here, right, you want to say, okay, I want to search for, I don't know, maybe um, native village in Hesargatta, right? That's the long tail keyword because not everybody might bid here. So your opportunity of identifying a customer who is actually looking for something, what he wants, and the chances of conversion is higher here. So that's kind of what is important that we really leverage both from a conversion ratio perspective and also a spend ratio perspective. So basically spend ratio is in nothing but like if you spend $1, how much are you getting back? Typically it's always losing money rather than getting money back in SCM. So, all right. Um, the next iteration of our te technology platform, right? So now we had 
okay, pretty sturdy Hadoop infrastructure. We had a pretty sturdy um, analytics framework. Data governance was being addressed, even though it's still not addressed completely, but we were in the right path of our vision, right? Then we started talking about real time. So all these Hadoop jobs are pretty cool because you get what you want, but they're all batch processes. So how do you really look at real time and what do you do to get to the real time? So there are multiple things that we tried out. Uh, I'm gonna talk about one use case here. So we actually used AWS and Redshift. So there were two use cases we were trying to go after. One was landing page optimization. And um, the other one was, again, I think it was a little bit more about improvement from our old uh, tool that we built for logs. So what we did was we used Redshift and AWS to really figure out, okay, let, if we roll out a landing page, so let's say we build a new page and we put it on the site, we want to see immediately how it's performing. So the, that framework basically kind of gives us, um, right here, so that, that this Redshift and AWS kind of gave us that real-time capabilities of how we build or look at things. The other case we were trying to get out of this, which we actually were able to get out, is campaign analysis. So every time you want to do promotions, you want to do campaigns, you want to see immediately how it's performing, right? There are a lot of things that get tied together, your revenue, your spend, your uh, customers, the visits, everything. So you want to see that in real time. These are the two big use cases where you want to see things in real time, other than the operations part of it, right? When, when people say real time analytics, um, you really need to go back and ask them the question, are you really gonna use real time? Because business folks cannot perform in real time. It's hard for them to change their strategy, change their um, tactical initiatives or whatever it is, right? So they always look at previous day's data, but there are tons of use cases where you need real time data and that's what we were actually trying to get to with this. Um, with this. So I think what, what I really wanted to convey in this session, other than the use cases and how we actually iterated through all the uh, platforms that we built out was the first and the foremost, right? No matter how cool your technology sounds, right? Hadoop, Kafka, you talk about Lens, everything. You don't use this data, you might as well take it and throw it in a dump. That's basically the message, right? You have to leverage it to make your business decisions or to change your business so that you can actually benefit from it. So that's basically the lesson number one. The second one is early in the game, right? Figure out what your strategy is, what your vision is in terms of your data platform, how you're gonna leverage this, what you're gonna do it. Stick to it, but be agile, change through the process, right? I mean, you saw as we went through three iterations, we are still going through a lot of iterations. Don't get hung up on saying that, hey, I invested here, I have to continue investing it. Fail fast, that's very important. The last one, right? I mean, this is the most trickiest one where I'm sure a lot of salespeople will be very happy. Build versus buy. You have to make a right decision when to build, when to buy. You, don't, you want to stick to your core business, right? You don't want to go build something which is not your core business. I mean, it, it is pretty cool to build it, but in, if the returns are not justifiable, you need to figure out build versus buy. So that's pretty much the story at Orbitz, which I wanted to share with you guys. And if you have any questions, I can take it. I know it's a long day for everybody. People are tired. Um, I can also stay back to answer a few questions if you have any. Thank you. So thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is about uh, mainly the hotel industry uses two types of business. One is the group and other is a transient business. Uh, the thing that you talked of, uh, of search and bookings happening between 15 to 60 days in advance. That is mostly for transient business. The group business happens way in advance. What's the other business you said? Group business. Group business. That is a qualified business. Yeah, yeah. So uh, is there any way Orbits uses this information? Because group in business probably would not happen through Orbits. Only the uh, um, non-corporate customers would be booking through 
uh, orbits. Can you give me an example of group business, what you're talking about? Because I know what you're talking about, but I just, I just want to understand what group business you're saying. Right. So let's say uh, I'm having uh, an MIDC area and I'm having uh, a hotel which is close by to that. So all the companies in that area make a contract with my hotel saying that if, if we give you a certain number of bookings in a year, you're going to give us a discount. But those bookings happen really in advance. They are like uh, planned visits of customers and stuff. So those bookings uh, probably won't go through orbits, but they're going to affect the number of bookings that come through orbits because finally they're going to uh, refer to a constraint, capacity constraint of the hotel itself. Okay, so there are, there are two pieces to this, right? One, yeah. most of the talk I did was more around the leisure business, okay? Yeah. Leisure business is like common man, like you and I go booking, that is the leisure business. Mm -hmm. We also separate corporate bookings, we also separate affiliate bookings. Like a simple example is American Express, right? If you go to American Express and try to book something, you don't know, but everything behind the scene is actually Orbit's platform. So all those bookings flow through us. So for us, it's, it's a matter of our own data, plus all the external data that we actually try to tie, right? Because one of the key concepts of analytics is competitive intelligence. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're growing at 5% and you feel really good saying, compared to last year, I'm growing at 5%. But if you look at the industry, you're actually at the bottom. People are growing at 20%, right? Yeah. You got to do that competitive intelligence. There are a lot of data sets that we buy actually, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of gives us the competitive intelligence which we use a lot of those things to decide how we do and what we do things. Right. And sometimes hotels also do their own forecasting and optimization of prices. So uh, do you uh, give this data back to the hotel saying that for the next 60 days there are a lot of we, searches? We, we do. We definitely do actually. So one of the things we do with all our partners, hotels, airlines is we actually tell them saying that, hey, this is how you're hotel is performing because they need an incentive to give us a better rate. That is a natural way of negotiating yeah. better prices, right? Yeah. So we pump a lot of data back to these partners, yeah. whether it's airlines or hotels, to show them how they are actually performing. Mm -hmm. And not just performing by bookings, right? We are talking about where are the customers coming who are actually booking your hotels? What kind of amenities that they like in your hotel? We kind of give a very elaborate uh, details there. So, thanks. I have one question. Uh, yeah, I will upload the slides, yes. yes. I have one question. Uh, have you done uh, uh, segmentations on the demand forecasting uh, and occupancy analytics? How, you, how did you uh, arrive? The segmentation part of it? Yeah. See, there are uh, multiple ways we do segmentation of data, right? So when you're talking about just the, are you talking about the hotel stay or the occupancy or which one are you talking uh, about? Uh, yeah. The occupancy, basically, right? So the way in travel industry we segment is multiple ways. Depends on the brand. Simple example is one of our brand is orbits.com, right? We are predominantly in US, right? For us, looking by country as a segment makes no sense. Yes. So we drill down to by city, by market. But on the other hand, we have another brand called hotelclub.com. Yes. For them, they operate in all of Asia Pacific, including India, right? For them, country matters a lot. So depending on the brand, we do a lot of segmentation. So we do market segmentation, we do basically channel segmentation, uh, we do basically the CLTV segmentation saying that, hey, are they tiered customer, non-tiered customer, where do they fall? So there are like, I don't know, maybe N number of segmentation yes. that we use actually. And, uh, I have one more question. How did you arrive uh, demand forecasting? Uh, I'm sorry? Demand forecasting. So demand forecasting is a pretty interesting topic. When you say forecasting, is it the visits forecasting or the booking forecasting? Booking. So booking forecasting is pretty easy for us because there are multiple things you look at. You look at seasonality, okay. you look at the industry, okay? You look at our past history, and you look at all our future roadmap, and you tie them. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous how we do the amount of time that we spend on forecasting, right? I mean, we spend like three to five months just but doing do you, forecasting. Do you, do you, apply the you look at all these things. We do, season. definitely we do apply actually. So unfortunately, we don't apply these um, thing in a wider scale. So it's, it's in a closed, because it's a pretty confidential stuff. So it's a closed group which where they do all these kind of forecasting, but they take all these aspects of it, not just what we have, even outside. It's like simple example, right? So today and tomorrow and day after is fifth elephant. We take things like this into consideration to figure out what is the hotel occupancy around Bangalore because people are traveling up from outside. So there are a lot of factors we consider that. Exactly. Yeah. 
So ClickView and Hive is something we did in 2010, I think, or 2011, I would say. Um, there are pros and cons with that. Um, if you go back in history from 2009 to, let's say, 2012, 2013, there are not too many visualization tools that really support uh, Hadoop. I mean, even today, for that matter, right? So ClickView is something it can connect to any database, right? So we actually used uh, Thrift um, uh, and uh, regular JDBC connection to connect to Hive. Yeah, directly through Hive. Yeah. You should send me a note, I'll tell you how to do it. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you basically had the problem that the virtual could be booked by some other website, right? No. No. So I told you we have a GDS. Think about GDS as a database, but not in our control, it's outside, right? A lot of people have access to this database, not just as Expedia, Priceline, we name 20,000 websites. When we search something, we want to get inventory, right? See, these are all inventory that we don't own. It's owned by airlines, it's owned by the hotels. GDS are the common place where everybody files their ratings. So we basically go to GDS and say, hey, give me the results for hotels for this city for these dates. When we do that, we are doing a look to them, right? Let's say I do 1,000 looks today and I do zero bookings. The look to book ratio is pretty bad there. That is why we optimize it by caching a lot of things in our thing. But when you cache anything, right, forget hotels, you have to optimize the TTL. If you don't optimize your TTL, then the whole point of cache is lost there. That is what we use survival analysis to optimize that. Uh, yeah. I have two questions. Uh, one question is about uh, when you try to one mic at a time. <laughs> yeah, uh, when you try to personalize, what are the first initial two to three features which you try to personalize? Mac was definitely the first one. Okay, and Mac uh, versus Windows. Second question I had was about you said about your purchasing uh, outside data sets, right? So can you tell us so like, what are the data sets which you purchase? So there are a lot of data sets that are available that you can purchase. Um, some of the data sets that we have used is uh, weather data. You can purchase that. There's something called Walk Score. You can purchase that. Walk score is very simple, right? You, you look at a hotel, and it considers a lot of attributes and calculates the proximity from the hotel. Like, how close is, to, is it to the highway? Uh, what, are the movie restaurant, uh, what are the restaurants around? Are there a movie theater? It, it comes up with a score for that hotel. So we use that data. Um, and then um, we've used a lot of third-party data, which is specific to marketing channels. Um, but these are some of the external data that we have. Obviously, social data, right? I mean, you have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You've you been speaking that? about uh, seasonality effect, right? So basically, it is a context, external context that you're feeding into your recommendations. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I How mean, that's, do you utilize this I don't know if uh, you heard exactly? the answer I gave this guy who's sitting here is competitive intelligence is very important for us because exactly. if I don't understand the seasonality, I can't forecast and I can't optimize anything. So we, we actually look at a lot of season. There are a lot of industry that publishes these kind of data, right? In US especially. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the year, they publish all the conference data. So you know Las Vegas is a conference hub. You want to optimize your hotels in Las Vegas. So you are going to consider all those things. What you do is you're going to say, hey, in March, there are these conferences which are very popular. Let's go negotiate better fares with these hoteliers there. Let's go grab some inventory with these hoteliers. So those are the optimizations. At the runtime, I'm asking about from the implementation perspective, <coughs> how do you feed in this data to your model? How do we feed this data into the model? Yeah, the context. There, 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 are, there are two ways. One we do offline, one is sort of an online, which is what feeds into your personalization, correct? Okay. But most of the things that you asked is all offline, yeah. because you can't really take that and every, it doesn't change every day, right? Uh, so. You yeah. mentioned something about uh, predictive analysis and machine learning at the top of the pyramid. Personalization so, was yeah. at the top. One of the use cases is personalization. Uh, how do you perform with so much data at your hand? How do you perform machine learning at that scale? Are you using some So we, we actually, the, if you remember my first iteration, the, we had something called a decentralized model, right? So we have, like, our tech team is around, uh, I'll probably say around five, or do we have to cut off? Yeah. Yes. Please come I down. It's anyways like a personal discussion here. Thank you. <laughs>